Dr. Pajari, thanks for agreeing to talk to Climate Change TV. What, what is your role over the next two weeks? Well, I'm supposed to address the COP uh, on the 30th, that's Wednesday. Uh, I'll have the luxury of about five minutes to give them all about the science of climate change. Uh, traditionally, the IPCC chair addresses the COP in the opening session, but I suppose today they found that there were far too many speakers, so there was greater focus on some of the political aspects rather than the science. But I personally think politics has to be uh, driven by a scientific assessment of climate change, both in respect of the impacts of inaction and the opportunities and attractiveness of action. And I hope uh, I will be able to speak about that on uh, the 30th when I address the COP. Do you, do you think science and its interaction with politics has been a problem in the field of climate change over the past 10 to 15 years? Not really, because, you know, come to think of it, uh, uh, if you look at the 23 years of the existence of the IPCC, uh, there's been an enormous uh, inflow of scientific information and knowledge uh, into the realm of policy making. And if you look at any such organization, and there really isn't one, historically, there hasn't been any body that sort of produces the science in an area of concern to society, which has had the kind of impact that the IPCC has had, not only on policymakers and leaders, but also the public at large. So I, I don't think it's a, it's a problem at all. It's uh, really something which perhaps requires uh, action to disseminate the results of science uh, to the public at large because we're dealing with uh, essentially democracies all over the world and if the public understands and requires action for the benefit of their children and grandchildren then surely leaders will be receptive to what needs to be done. The, the sense of urgency regarding climate change is clear when you read the IPCC's publications this year and also an IEA report as well. Do you sense that same urgency amongst the delegates here in Durban? I'm afraid I don't and that's precisely why it's so important to emphasize and re-emphasize the scientific findings and as it happens this year has been a special year for the IPCC. We brought out two special reports, the first dealing with uh, uh, renewable energy sources and climate change mitigation and the other one essentially dealing with extreme events and disasters and how we might, might be able to advance adaptation to some of these events. So, you know, I think it was a unique moment, and I think this moment still exists during this COP, to be able to inform the delegates about the seriousness of the impacts that we're going to face if we don't do anything. I mean, just to give you an example, we brought out very clearly in this report that by the end of the century, uh, if we don't do anything about this problem, then clearly heat waves which would have taken place, let's say, once in 20 years during the period 1980 to 2000, would occur once in two years. And that's pretty serious. And we've also clearly brought out the finding that extreme precipitation events are on the increase, and they would increase even further as time goes on if we don't take action. So the point I'm making is I think it's critically important to lay these facts before the delegates of this conference so that they understand the imperatives and the essentiality of taking action on a timely basis. Otherwise, they just get involved in short-term political issues. And I think there's a larger problem over here, which is something that confronts all of humanity and all living species on this planet. And I think that's what we need to bring out. What's even more important is to bring out the opportunities that we have. You know, if you look at the cost of renewable sources of energy and technologies associated with these sources, they've been coming down. And we brought out very clearly in our special report that there are some applications where, as it happens, renewable energy is already competitive with conven conventional sources of energy. So I think if delegates were to understand both sides of the problem or, the both, or both sides of their responsibility, perhaps 
the discussions that take place will be on a much more rational basis. And there has been near unanimity among scientists now about the dangers of climate change. Do you think there has been a problem uh, about the communication of climate change over the past five to ten years? And do you see any signs of that, that change or improving in different parts of the world? Well, I think that really has been a problem. And it's a challenge which, frankly, the scientific community has not been able to handle effectively. And this may be because of the inherent nature of science and what scientists regard as the main mission in life. And that really isn't um, inclusive of communicating science to the public. But what I would submit is we've got, what, 15 to 20,000 people over here? What better opportunity to communicate the scientific findings of the IPCC than to iterate, than to reiterate that repeatedly to this August body because these are people that will go back and uh, will be able to tell their constituents, their constituencies and uh, their colleagues in the government and elsewhere. So I personally think this is really a wonderful opportunity to sort of close the gap that exists between the work of scientists and the perception of policymakers and the public. And in terms of conveying that urgency, what else can the IPCC do? You've, you've released these reports, which we've seen this year, as have some of your scientific colleagues. Um, the, the evidence seems very clear. What more can you do to convince governments that the time to act is now, as opposed to some government suggesting already that maybe they'll wait two, three, four years before coming to a, a sustainable global deal? Well, I think what we really need to do is to clearly bring out the disparities that exist in terms of vulnerability between different parts of the world. And uh, we brought out, for instance, in this special report on extreme events, that most of the deaths that take place, about 90% of them, uh, as a result of weather and climate-related incidents, take place in the developing countries. And I think we also need to highlight the fact that there are some communities, some societies, which are extremely vulnerable and therefore, I think there's not only a moral responsibility on the part of the global community to see that we ensure their protection and well-being, but also, I would say, uh, an overall economic imperative because it's much easier for the world and far less costly to take action to prevent some of the worst impacts of climate change than to have to deal with a massive crisis and a problem that could occur in the future if these extreme events and disasters were to affect the lives and livelihoods of the most vulnerable communities on earth. And in terms of these two weeks, what, what are you really hoping to see? I mean, there's, there's a lot of talk out there about the new Green Climate Fund, um, perhaps sort of uh, punitive uh, taxes on emissions of airlines and maritime and lots of other potential. What would you like to see decided this week and next week? Well, what I'd like to see is perhaps not quite tangible, but critically important. I'd like to see people leaving this place with a sense of optimism and a feeling that we're on, a, on the move and that we're going to be able to deal with this problem effectively and collectively. And I think this is where we need to see a lot of things happening over here by which we create a sense of confidence Firstly, in the multilateral system itself, and secondly, in terms of our ability as human society to be able to deal with this challenge. Uh, now, how do you make this happen? There's a whole range of steps that would have to be taken. And most importantly, I would like to see people going away from here fully understanding some of the scientific imperatives why action has to be taken and the attractiveness of taking the right steps, certainly in the case of mitigation, because we brought out very clearly that mitigation measures have huge co-benefits in respect of health benefits for communities because you'll have lower levels of air pollution as a result of mitigation actions, certainly higher levels of energy security, perhaps much greater employment, uh, a much more secure future in terms of food for the 
for, for society at large because the impacts of climate change on agriculture will not enter into an area where uh, the reduction of yields take place to a level where food security is affected adversely. So I think there's a whole range of things that I'd like people who are attending this conference of the parties to go back fully digesting and understanding. And if that were to happen, then I think we would see some degree of uh, determination and a political will to take the necessary steps. And finally, on a, on a personal note, you've, you've endured a lot of criticism over the years. Do you never feel like just packing it in and going and sitting on a beach and relaxing, or is this just too, too important a problem for you to, for you to leave in, in this current situation? Well, you know, to be quite honest, I'd much rather do this because I enjoy this much more. I'd love to go on the beach and relax. But I find that the joy one gets out of doing something like this is incalculable. And it's something you can't compare with anything else. Plus, I think I have accepted a certain responsibility. I have a mission to complete the fifth assessment report. And I'm going to do everything possible to see that that task is accomplished as uh, successfully as possible. So no, I have never once uh, given this thought any serious consideration. And I'm there, and I'm going to do my best. And I'll give, give it all it takes to see that the IPCC moves on from strength to strength. We realize that, you know, in the field of science, debate, uh, dissent, and discussion are essential to strengthen uh, whatever is being done by the scientific community. And to that extent, we welcome whatever questioning that takes place. But what we really need to avoid is um, what I would say is vested interests coming in the way. Uh, but that's part of life, and I'm prepared to face it. And a last question, just on that fifth assessment report. Do you feel this could be the fundamentally crucial report that, that might ever been, have uh, been created um, in terms of climate change? Well, frankly, we thought the fourth assessment report was that kind of a report. Uh, and I think it had a major impact, but it also created a reaction on the part of some people. So I'm not counting my chickens before they hatch. Yes, the fifth assessment report will be a robust, a very strong, um, and a reliable report, which certainly will advance our knowledge of the subject of climate change substantially. And I hope by then the world is prepared to accept it and act on it. In fact, I would hope the world is ready to do that even before we bring out the fifth assessment report.